American woman metaphysic, poem of the week number 40, before the birth of one of her children, by Anne Bradstreet, 1612 to 1672. Before the birth of one of her children. All things within this fading world hath end, adversity doth still our joys attend. No ties so strong, no friends so dear and sweet, that with death's parting blow is sure to meet. The sentence past is most irrevocable, a common thing, yet, oh, inevitable. How soon, my dear, death may my steps attend, how soon it may be thy lot to lose thy friend. We are both ignorant, yet love bids me these farewell lines to recommend to thee, that when that knot's untied that made us one, I may seem thine, who in effect am none. And if I see not half my days that's due, what nature would God grant to yours and you, the many faults that well you know I have, that be interred in my oblivious grave, if any worth or virtue were in me, let that live freshly in thy memory. And when thou feel'st no grief, as I no harms, yet love thy dead, who long lay in thine arms, and when thy loss shall be repaid with gains, look to my little babes, my dear remains. And if thou love thyself, or lovest me, these to protect from stepdame's injury. And if chance to thine eyes shall bring this verse, with some sad sighs, honour my absent hearse, and kiss this paper for thy love's dear sake, who with salt tears this last farewell did take. Anne Bradstreet was born in England in 1612 and arrived in the Puritan colony of Massachusetts at the age of 18. She remained in America for the rest of her life, and the new geographic location no doubt fed into her work. But to call her as American as any other poet, let alone apple pie, would nonetheless be a bit of a stretch, not to mention confusing. It would be like calling her colonial contemporary Sor Juana Inés de la Cruz, 1648 to 1695, a Mexican poet, one to a certain extent sequestered from the political and cultural influence of the Spanish Golden Age. For beside the fact that Bradstreet spent her formative years in the old world, she also wrote in a period when the very notion of American national independence and even the semblance of an American national myth simply did not exist. On a purely literary level, it is also impossible to divide Bradstreet from the poetic undercurrents of her natal soil. Linguistic archaisms aside, how much don't some of the metaphoric complexities and the richness of the contrasts in the poem above read like the late flourishings of English metaphysics. I have written a couple of posts about the metaphysics before, wanting to highlight how unappreciated they are as a whole, and I highly encourage my readers to compare Bradstreet's poems with other poets of the school, such as Sir Henry Wotton, Sir Robert Ayton, John Donne, Aurelian Townsend, Edward Herbert, Sir Francis Kiniston, Henry King, Francis Qualls, George Herbert, Thomas Carey, James Paulin, Richard Crawshaw, Thomas Philippot, or Andrew Marvell. The really lamentable result of having discouraged women from artistic pursuits throughout history is that we have such a relatively small corpus of good works that properly express the joy and suffering of the female experience. Poems like the one above. I admire the feminist pursuit of going back in history in order to resurface forgotten works produced by women, but feel they have been largely unsuccessful in bringing to light pieces of real quality. Ironically, they have often done a fair bit to diminish the work of women of true artistic power, like Anne Bradstreet, by obfuscating their quality, juxtaposing them aside writers of little skill, such as Afra Ben or the Duchess of Newcastle. Gender, as any peruser of modern poetry will know, is a red-hot topic among contemporary poets, and has been for some time. Yet the irony is that, having largely been weaponised as a political pursuit which on a purely political level I can often sympathise with, I scarcely find a single work that is artistically successful in capturing the personal passion of the likes of the poem featured here. On a qualitative level, can we justly say that the current state of poetry written by women is in any better shape? Four, five rhyme stanzas in iambic pentameter. The first four are sestets and the final a quatrain. The rhymes are all in couplets. Analysis. The title reveals very well what the poem is about, yet the first stanza is a more general meditation on the human condition and how close to us death is. 
Writing in a time when childbirth claimed the lives of many women, Bradstreet had all the reason to be contemplating her departure from this world. In the second stanza, there is a narrowing, however, as Bradstreet addresses someone. One can read this as an address to the baby in her womb or even to the reader, yet the terms of endearment hint that this is her husband that she is speaking to. Quote, How soon, my dear, death may my steps attend. How soon it may be thy lot to lose thy friend. We are both ignorant, yet love bids me these farewell lines to recommend to thee, that when that knot's untied that made us one, I may seem thine, who in effect am none. End quote. The idea that this is her husband she is writing to is made more obvious in the succeeding stanza, in which she talks of what he will remember of her when she is gone. Quote, the many faults that well you know I have, let be interred in my oblivious grave. If any worth or virtue were in me, let that live freshly in thy memory. End quote. In the next stanza, it is almost as though Bradstreet is certain that she will predecease her husband. And what comes next is almost as cold as a will, a message for when grief has died and her husband reasonably be allowed to remarry, that he will protect the poet's children from a mean stepmother. Quote, and when thy loss shall be repaid with gains, look to my little babes, my dear remains, and if thou love thyself or lovest me, these two protect from stepdame's injury. Yet the personal suffering packs a punch in the final stanza. Once again, it really feels like Bradstreet is convinced that she is going to die giving birth to her baby, and she wants to use this poem as a means of bidding farewell. Quote, and if chance to thine eyes shall bring this verse, with some sad sighs honour my absent hearse, and kiss this paper for thy love's dear sake, who with salt tears this last farewell did take.